Valentine's Day. Um, hope it's been good for you. The passage of Scripture, as they mentioned in the video, is known as the love chapter. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'd like to share one part of this chapter with you tonight. Just one brief little part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Let me say that last thing again. Love keeps no record of wrongs. See, this verse has some pretty important things that it says within it. And one of those things is simply this. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You see, we all keep records of things. We all keep track of things. For example, at home, if we have bills to pay, we keep record of those bills that we pay, especially if we can itemize them and put them on taxes and things like that, then we keep a record of all the bills we pay to make sure we can put those where they need to go or keep a file of them or, you know, alphabetize them or anything like that. All of us keep those kind of a record, paper records. We keep records of things because we have to. Sometimes we keep records of mistakes or wrongs. For example, if we buy something from a store and we notice when we take it home and we hook it up or plug it up or, or make it and something's missing or there's a, a mistake in it or something like that, or if it doesn't work right, then we write it down. We, we keep a record of it so that we know, you know that it may have come with a warranty or something like that. And we know that if we can just uh, turn it in and then we might get our money back for it or we can swap it or we can do something different because we want to make sure we keep a record of that so that we can turn it back in and make it right. So we are going to keep record of certain wrongs. But how about earthly wrongs? Do we keep record of earthly wrongs? You see, when we read this passage of Scripture or this verse, one of the things we immediately think about is husband's and wives. It's that relationship where the scripture says love keeps no record of wrongs. But why is that so important? Well, it's so important because no one wants it held over their head when they make mistakes or when they do things that are wrong. After all, aren't we supposed to move on in life when we make a mistake? Aren't we supposed to forgive and forget? And aren't we supposed to just um, let it go when someone does something wrong and we ask for forgiveness and they say it's no problem, don't worry about it. Aren't we supposed to just move on? We are. But sometimes that's so hard to do. And sometimes we just kind of hold it in and keep it there. I wonder how many people we know that, that love to hold on to people's wrongs. In other words, when somebody does something wrong to them... Instead of moving on, what they want to do is they want to keep it sort of in a file, sort of in a folder, as if to say, when they, when somebody else does something wrong to me, I'm going to bring this back out. For example, if, if somebody says something about you or hurts you, and they come up to you and say, I'm sorry about that, I didn't mean to do that. Instead of saying, that's okay, and letting it go, we kind of file that away in our computer, in our mind. And then when they do something else by mistake, we bring that back up. We bring it back up. I mean, it could have been months ago. It could have been years ago. It could have been when we first got married. And, and mentally, we kind of filed something that went wrong in the back of our mind. I remember uh, when I first got married. Kathy's not here tonight, so I can talk about it. And uh, unless she watches it on YouTube, I'm not in trouble. Unless y'all share what happens. Um, which could happen, right, Scott? You just never know. That's right, yeah. Um, but anyhow, I remember we got married. We went to seminary, and we were in the apartment. And um, I had never, I guess, Kathy told me, I had never called her by her first name. Which sounds weird. But we always had those pet names, those nicknames. Um... um we won't go into those, but we had names for one another. And so um, I remember we were in our apartment in our kitchen, this very small apartment, 
And, you know, finances were not really great when I was in seminary. I had a, a part-time youth minister's job, and Kathy was teaching. But, I mean, you know, we had loans to pay and things like that, so we weren't really having a lot of money. And so when you buy groceries, I mean, they were tight. They were precious. They were like gold when you had groceries. I mean, even seminary round steak, which is now called bologna, was important. It was important. And so we would go to the grocery store and spend like $65 a week, and Kathy would be like, boy, I hope it doesn't go up any more than this. This is a lot of money, and of course it's going way up now. But um, I remember we had some drinks, some soft drinks in the kitchen. And she was putting up some curtains or some, what do they call them, valances, something like that. And so she was putting those up, and I was sitting at the table, and one of the two liter drinks that I was pouring in my glass tipped over and just was pouring and pouring and pouring. And she said, um, pick it up. And I said, Kathy, I am. And she started crying. And I said, what are you crying about? And she said, you've never called me by my first name. And that was loud. <laughs> and that sounded mad. I thought, I've never done that. And you know, here we are 30 years later. And if you ask her about that story, very clear. Very clear. Because it, it impressed an image in her mind. Now sometimes, that's kind of a comical image that I use, but sometimes they're not that comical. Sometimes people file those things away and use them as ammunition. You know, because they just don't want to give it up. They don't want to let it go. They keep that record of a wrong, and, and in their mind they're ready to use it again when they have the opportunity to. You see, in a relationship, we can't do that. We're told to, to move on. But what about our relationship with God? <clears throat> Which is what we're really here to talk about tonight. Do we honestly want God to share with us the list of the wrongs we've done to Him and against Him? I'm not sure about you, but my list would be quite lengthy of things that I've done to God or hurt Him in certain ways. Times when probably I needed to pray, but instead I felt like I had all the answers on my own, and so my prayer was more like, God, if I need you, I'll come to you, but right now I think I've got this. Instead of taking our problems and our decisions to God. Or times when I should have read God's word more or studied God's word more. But I, I needed to do something else or felt I needed to do something else. And so I let that get in the way of my study time and my Bible time. Other things I've done which were known as wrongs. Or as the Bible says it in Romans 3.23, sins. Those sins that I've displeased God with. So now if this verse that I just read says, love keeps no records of wrongs, why is it that God does? Why is it that God keeps a record of what we do? Well, the reason is because of what we're going to talk about tonight. Here's our test question for tonight. Who remembers? Well, never mind. It's <laughs> Who remembers the title of our study? Good, very good. <laughs> I didn't know I clicked the head of it. So, so we have our study. Now here's what we're going to talk about tonight. And that is this. The promise of forgiveness. You know, Debbie talked this morning about how sometimes we need to go back to those promises. Sometimes we need to revert back to uh, the beginning. And this is one of the great promises that Christ gave us. And that is the promise of forgiveness. And He chose the nails. Now we're studying about the cross, we're studying about those things that maybe we overlook when we think about Easter, when we think about the cross, things that are unnoticed. And several weeks ago we started this by talking about the fact that the soldiers, as they were taking Jesus from being beaten to the cross, they decided on their own that they were going to try to humiliate Christ. And they began to spit on Him and mock Him and make fun of Him trying to make them small as they try to make themselves big. We've also talked about the fact that along that same route, there was this one soldier who decided to weave a crown of thorns, of these major thorns, I mean big, sharp, heavy thorns, and, 
and weaved a crown out of that and placed that on Jesus' head out of humiliation to mock him and to make him hurt and bleed as part of the journey Christ had to go for us. And tonight, what I want us to think about is this. I want us to think about what happened when the soldiers took Jesus' body and think about what Jesus' body had gone through after being beaten and whipped and after having to go through all of that that, that they did to his body physically and then as they were taking his body and causing him to, to carry the cross and to carry that beam and, and even in his weariness and, and tired body as he laid on the ground where they were going to put him on the cross they began with his hands. They begin with his hands, and, and one of the images we have of this are the three nails. The three nails that they put his hands and feet on the cross with. Now think about it just for a minute, if you would please. Jesus' hands. Think about your hands just for a minute. Think about from the time you were born until this point in your life. How many things have your, have your hands done? How many accomplishments have you made with your hands? How many things have taken place with your hands that we often never even think about? I mean, there are a lot of things that we do with our hands, a lot of things that our hands have gone through that we may forget about. For example, how many of you remember holding handlebars as you learned to ride a bike? Or a motorcycle? Bike was first. Bike was first. Or how many remember holding the steering wheel of a car? Or a car key the first time. The first time you remember putting a car key in your hand. I can remember the first time I got a car key. It was given to me. It was probably given to me before I got my license so that my parents could help, uh, would let me warm up the car. And within your hand, you had the power to start this machine. You didn't go anywhere, but you did get to start the car. It's a lot of power. Or... The first time you opened a college book to begin studying. <clears throat> or the time when you held the hands of your spouse and said, I do. Or the times when you helped your children learn to walk. Or grandkids learn to walk. Or times when you caught your child or grandchild when they jumped off the side of the pool into your arms. Or the times when you carried wood, if your power was out, you used a fireplace, things like that. You know, there's so many things that we do with our hands that we often take for granted. Now, think about what Jesus did with his hands as he grew up. Now, we're not told a lot about his childhood, except that he went to the temple to study. But what did Jesus' dad do? Carpenter. Now, if you have children, how many times do they want to help you do what you're doing? Or grandchildren. How many times do they want to help you? Whatever it is you're doing, um, how many times do they want to help you do it? I can imagine Jesus wanted to help his dad build something. You know, whatever it was, he probably wanted to help. He wanted to get his hands dirty. He wanted to help. But think of other things Jesus did as he began his ministry. There was a time when the disciples were out in a boat and this storm came up. And we're told in the scripture that Jesus was in the bottom of the boat. He was resting. He was with them, but he was resting and they didn't really understand that. And when this storm came up, they begin to cry out in fear and, and they ask questions like, why are you going to let us die? Why, why are you letting this happen? And Jesus got up and he got on the boat at where, the, where they could see him 
And the scripture says that he, he put out his hands and he simply said, peace be still. And at his hands, calm the storm. With his hands. We're told about a time in the Bible when, when Jesus met this blind man. And this blind man knew who Jesus was. He knew about Jesus. And he knew that Jesus could help him. And we're told in the scripture that Jesus with his hands took some dirt and, and put it in his hands and spit, spit in his hands and he rubbed that together and then he took that and he placed it on the man's eyes and he told him to go wash them in the pool. And he did. And we're told in the scripture that the man could see. He healed with his hands. He loved with his hands. Children that came to him, he hugged with his hands. But Jesus also had hands that turned over tables when people were making the temple a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. Jesus did many, many things with his hands. And now this hand that he had done so many things with was being laid on this beam with a nail on it. And a soldier holding a mallet. High in the air, getting ready to nail his hands to the cross. Why would Jesus do this? Why would he allow those hands that could have been clenched? Now, I don't know about you, if somebody puts something in my hand, they're fixing to do that, I'm going to automatically clench my fists to try to keep it from happening. Jesus didn't do that. And here's the reason why. In our, our verse of scripture for tonight, Colossians 2, verse 14. He canceled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. Canceled the record that contained the charges against us. Why does Jesus why do they keep a list of our wrongs? of our mistakes. It's because of this reason. You see, one of the things, or the thing that Jesus knew was this, if I clench my fist, and I do not allow that nail to be driven into my hand, what needs to happen will not take place. What needs to happen in order for that to be canceled, that record to be canceled, will not take place. God's plan will not take place. You see, I think it's pretty amazing to think that the space between where the mallet was up in the air and the hands of Christ was the space that contained that list of our wrongs, that list of our sins, and you know, between the mallet space, the space where the mallet was, and the nail on Jesus' hand, Jesus had that long to think, do I open my hand, or do I close it and keep it from happening? And the scripture tells us that Jesus allowed it to happen. You see, Jesus knew this one simple thing. If I don't allow this to happen, a lot of things will not take place in the lives of these people that we that I love. Yeah, he could have stopped it. He could have kept it from happening. I want to read to you what it says in Eugene Peterson's The Message from the same verse. When you were stuck in your old sin dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. But God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. The slate clean. That's what Jesus knew. If I open my hand and allow this nail to be driven in my hand, sins will be gone. The slate will be clean. <coughs> sins will be forgiven. What we need to remember, and one of the great things 
about what Christ did is that while we tend to want to hide our mistakes and keep others from seeing who we are, no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, we can't keep those sins from Christ. He already knows them. He knows what we've done in the past. He knows what we're doing now. He knows what we're going to do in the future. He knows our thoughts. He knows our minds. He knows our hearts. He knows our condition physically, emotionally, mentally, and more importantly, Christ knows our condition spiritually, where we are with Him and where we need to be. Christ knows all that. Christ knows why we don't do things people tell us to do. Christ knows why we don't do things people ask us to do. Christ knows why we don't obey Him the way we should. You see, Christ knows that list. That list that we hide, that list that we keep from other people. That list that we don't want other people to see. And what Jesus knew was that if He allowed that mallet to come down on that nail, and if He allowed those soldiers to nail His hands to the cross, the list of wrongs that we try to hide and keep from others would be paid for and canceled. We wouldn't have to carry them anymore. We wouldn't have to have them like weights that are hanging on us and and keep us from doing the things Christ wants us to do. They wouldn't hold us down. They wouldn't hold us back. But they would be released and we would be free from those sins. But more importantly, Christ knew that if He allowed the soldiers to put those nails in His hands, we would be with Him forever. You see, if He clenched His fist, not only would our sins not be taken care of, we would have no hope of eternal life. Let me ask you tonight, how many people do you know in this life that you want to spend eternity with? Have you ever thought about that? Now there may be people you work with that when 5 o'clock gets there, you're like, boy, I'm glad. Because <laughs> really I've had about it to hear that person. And if they're not out, I mean, if they're out tomorrow, so be it. <laughs> because we don't want to see them. There may be times in the family when you're like, Woo! You know, I'm glad vacation's over and I can get back home instead of being at that family reunion. <laughs> oh, that's kind of tough. Won't ask for hands, but you know, sometimes when you go to those family reunions that drive up, it's like, okay, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's not what we're going to talk about. Here's how we're going to handle it. This comes up, and don't you dare even bring that up. <laughs> because that's tough. So there's, there's, you know, there's people in life that, uh, as Scott says, how do I say this gently? Just get on our nerves. Let that bother us. But you know, Christ, Christ, even though we do those things to Him, we get on His nerves and. We bother him and we annoy him. I don't know how many times in the day I think, I wonder if I'm annoying Christ today. Asking him for the same thing over and over and over and over and over. But Christ, even in that annoyance, wants to live with us forever. Or else, or otherwise, he wants us to live with him forever. He wants to spend eternity with you. <coughs> he wants to be with you all the time. Now, I've thought about that. You know, it may be because he knows there's going to be so many people there, he can kind of get away sometimes. <laughs> Appreciate it, Johnny. I'm going to walk over here just a little bit, and I'll be back to be with you. But he wants to spend eternity with us, folks. He loves us that much. And that's why instead of keeping a clenched fist, he opened his hand. And he allowed that mallet to come down. He allowed him to drive those nails through his hands and his feet. He knew our sins could not be forgiven any other way. And he knew for a fact there was no other way we could ever have eternal life. 
So it's because of this that Jesus, as he was lying there, allowed the soldier to take his hand, allowed the soldier to open it up. He allowed the soldier to take the nail and place it on his hand. He allowed the soldier to take the mallet and raise it in the air. And he allowed it to start coming down. And he allowed it to hit. Because he loves us. Because he cares about us. And because he wanted us to have a future. Because of love. Because of sacrifice. And the only response we can have is what a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Lord. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we individually, personally, respond to that kind of forgiveness? How do we respond to that kind of love?